Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Sanandam Bordeloy. Drought can be a major problem for tomatoes, particularly in changing climates. Water-absorbent polymers can help water stay in the soil to help tomatoes thrive, but costs can be a problem for farmers to implement them. In this episode, Sanandam joins me to discuss his research into developing more affordable, effective water-absorbent polymers from the waste material fly ash. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but before we dive in, we want to thank our sponsor for this episode, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers are leveraging environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash field lab earth i'm your host abby morrison let's talk about science hi everyone welcome to the show today we have dr sanandam bordeloy with us sanandam is a tenure track assistant professor at alto university he has a phd in civil engineering he's conducted research in a top 20 ranked university with postdoctoral appointments at hong kong university of science and technology and university of illinois in urbana champaign he has multidisciplinary research interests spanning from geotechnical engineering, material science, and agricultural engineering. Hello, Sanandam. How are you today? Hello, Abby. I'm doing quite good. Greetings from Finland. Yeah, lovely to have you on another part of the world. Very exciting as always. So... Today, we are talking about some ways to combat drought in tomatoes. So to get us started, can you just kind of explain some of the issues that tomato faces? Well, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, So because of climate change, there have been recent uh, instances of droughts, particularly the period of drought and the extent of drought. So for uh, vegetables such as tomato, which requires relatively high amount of water, in these adverse conditions, because of climate change and associated droughts, um, a lot of uh, crops are facing uh, existential threats, particularly tomato, uh, where there is not enough water in the agricultural soil. So, This is one of the problems as to how we can sustain enough water in agricultural fields so that these kind of crops can grow and lead to food securities, particularly for communities which are struck hard by uh, uh, this extreme droughts because of climate change. Sure. So your research was dealing with um, these water-absorbing polymers or WAPs. Am I getting that acronym correct? Correct. Very correct. Good. Good. Uh, So you were looking at these polymers and how they might be able to combat this drought. So to get everybody on the same page, could you talk a little bit about just these polymers, how they're made, how they get used in in uh, in a field or a greenhouse scenario, as well as what fly ash is, because I know you use that as part of this experiment also. So thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, what is a polymer? A polymer can be any substance uh, or material uh, which can which is basically composed of short units. Uh, or can, it can be any chemical units. They are called monomers. And if you chain them uh, on top of each other, they become kind of so-called a polymer. Basically, it is a group of similar types of molecules um, that has specific properties uh, tailor-made based on what what is your initial chemical uh, uh, building units. So something along those is what a polymer is. The second thing uh, that you ask is that as I said, polymer has different uh, applications. Right now, uh, say for us, uh, 
a, a polymer is something that we were using so that we can increase the water absorption capacity of soil. Um, so in, in this case, we were trying to make a, a so-called polymers, which has a very high affinity of holding uh, water or H2O molecules. So this, uh, I will not go into the science of how it was produced, but basically what we were doing is we were taking a relatively uh, waste material, uh, which is called fly ash. It is a byproduct of the uh, coal-based uh, power generation industry. So basically we transform the so-called fly ash uh, into this kind of polymers so that we can develop a relatively sustainable, cheap, as well as widely available uh, polymers so that we can improve the water retention capacity of the soil. Nice. Okay. I really like that it's kind of taking a waste product and turning it into something useful. Uh, that was something that kind of drew me to this research. So when you're using these polymers, um, and, and maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but are you like um, mixing them in with the soil that the crops are being grown in? Are you just scattering them across the top? What, is, what does that look like? So um, the use of polymers here is like as a conditioner. So when you do tillage, when you're about to say uh, transplant your plants uh, or seeds in, into the soil, you need to kind of tillage it. So what we did was basically we mixed uh, this kind of uh, materials in a certain proportion to the soil while we were doing the tillage. Okay. All right. That's that's kind of what I was thinking. So I just wanted to confirm um, one extra question about that. Do you like soak them before you mix them in or do you just when you when you water the plant or it rains or whatever, does it just absorb it and hang on to it? Very that, interesting or? question. Uh, uh, the, the polymers that we were that were developed from this so-called fly ash was basically solid in nature. It's like a powdery material. So it's very easy to mix with the soil when you're doing the tillage. So these polymers so-called are water absorbing. So when the rain comes or when you irrigate it as it is uh, in general practice, what it does is that it absorbs the, the amount of this water that is in the soil pores and does not let it freely drain into the lower layers of the soil. So that is in, in, in basic when it comes in with uh, uh, with in touch with this water molecules, it forms a so-called kind of like a gel-like material. Oh, fun. I like that. It reminds yeah. me of like a chia seeds when they get wet. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, people used to make, uh, can make polymers out of chia seeds because they also have some amount of these uh, polymers in them that can absorb water. So very nice. Oh, that's analogy. so fun. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> very fun. So... You were comparing then different types of these polymers, including ones that had been made with the fly ash. So can you tell us more about kind of the hypothesis or goals of what you were hoping to test in this specific research? Okay. Um, if for this study, we were only uh, focused on one type of so-called novel polymer that our lab had developed. Um, but we were comparing its uh, efficacy with that of conventional uh, uh, so-called polymers that are being used. So the target area is for relatively underprivileged or developing communities where uh, so-called um, utilization of relatively expensive conventional, conventional polymers uh, might be a bit of uh, a hassle. So this polymer that was developed is from waste materials. Fly ash is mostly, uh, we can, it is available in most of the developing countries because most developing or even underdeveloped countries are based with, on the coal energy. So the idea is that um, we wanted to show where this water absorbing polymers developed from these waste materials, can it actually absorb water and keep it to themselves? or they can avail this water when drought conditions strike in and they can give this water to the plants. So the key word here is plant available water content. So the hypothesis was, 
can these uh, relatively low cost and sustainable polymers can be used to increase the plant available water content in, in, in the soil so that during drought conditions, the water from these polymers can be used by the plants so that they can grow, they have high yield, and they have uh, say so-called vegetables with high quality. Sure. And you had a few different then uh, treatment types that you were testing here. So can you talk a little bit more about how what what different treatments you were testing specifically, as well as how you were testing for that plant available water content? Well, uh, in terms of treatment, what we were doing is that we were trying to uh, change the amount of these uh, polymers and see at what condition they would be better for, for the plant growth. And uh, what we did was that we quantified, uh, first of all, the improvement in the plants, uh, improvement in the soil properties. Uh, it's basically called as a soil water retention capacity. And the second thing that we uh, did was that we tried to measure the quality and the yield of these tomato plants based on the number of fruits that it gave and in the, in, in the quality of the uh, so-called uh, these uh, vegetables in terms of its weight. Okay. That makes sense. Um, was, this, was this in a greenhouse scenario or a field scenario? Well, uh, it, this study was done in a field scenario. Uh, there have been previous trials that were done uh, in, in a lab house, in, in a so-called greenhouse uh, environment. But based on reviewers' uh, uh, advice in previous communication, particularly for this uh, application or this uh, uh, paper, uh, we did this test in a field uh, somewhere in, in the northeast of India. Okay. And when you're testing these different ratios, like how how much variance is there in the ratios of... Uh, these polymers to just the regular soil? Like, is it like, you know, they're all within 20% or is it like 20, 50, 80? I mean, how much, how much of the stuff is going into the soil? Okay. So we started with only 5%, which is a very relatively uh, small amount of 5% by uh, so-called weight uh, of these polymers into the soil. Uh, and with if we compare it to say uh, soils where there was no uh, conditioning conditioning done, the, the, the yield parameters such, such as the fruits, the total weight and shoot fresh biomass of the soil was increased by around uh, 80 to almost 120 percentage. Whoa, that's huge. <laughs> that's so high. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Sanandam's paper, Efficacy of Novel Water Absorbing Polymer Amended Soil for Improving Drought Resilience of Solanum Lycopersicum, published in Soil Science Society of America Journal, is always freely available. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsor, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers are leveraging environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash Earth. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, okay, so you were looking at a few of those, uh, the water capacity and the yield and the weight and such like that. I also have a note here that you were looking at things like stomatal conductance and leaf photosynthesis and maybe one more. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, not only like what those are and how they were helpful to, to measure for this research, but 
like how you measure those? All right. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, particularly, uh, I have a background in civil engineering. And when I was conducting this research, uh, these terms were very new to me. So I also searched on how I can simplify and tell it to my say, supervisor what it basically means. So for first instance, tomato conductance, uh, if I have to make it uh, simple and let you let the audience know, it is basically the rate at which a plant would breathe in uh, 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 CO2 or carbon dioxide and exhale uh, the oxygen. So the rate at which, uh, say, a human being breathes, your breathing rate, that is similar to what is tomato conductance for leaves. So it's basically how the leaves of these plants are uh, emitting uh, 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 this oxygen as well as uh, water vapor into the atmosphere is what is called a stomatal conductance. And number sure. two, uh, when we say about plant photosynthesis, uh, it's basically you can imagine it to be uh, equivalent to your pulse rate. So as long as your um, pulse rate is going good, you're alive. Whereas uh, when things are getting a bit dodgy uh, and your pulse rate is dropping, that's when uh, we say that the plant is experiencing a lot of drought and the plant photosynthesis rate actually reduces. Okay. Does does the stomatal conductance, does that like lower when when a plant is stressed by drought or is it a way to measure like how much you mentioned water vapor like is that measuring how much extra they've got to give i mean how, do, how does that one relate the short answer is it's both so uh, if we say consider an environment which where everything is kept constant in that case uh, if you if, if a plant is kept in a relatively a water stress condition with respect to another where there is no water stress. In that case, the stomatal conductance of the water stressed uh, uh, so, uh, plant would be much lower than that of the one which has a healthy amount of uh, uh, plant available water. But these kind of uh, uh, phenomena such as uh, or properties called as stomatal conductance also depends on say the relative humidity of the atmosphere, how fast the winds are blowing, uh, and what kind of plants they are. So there are a lot of variable factors that affect stomatal conductance. So in short, stomatal conductance as a parameter for uh, plant uh, resistance against drought is a bit variable, but in case of plant photosynthesis, uh, it is much more uh, sure shot way to understand how, how much plants are stressed against drought. Okay. Okay, I'm glad I, I asked those questions because I think they're really neat. Uh, I always love, I'm a huge fan of when science projects have elements that have additional variables that can affect them and just how how scientists control for that or use other factors to kind of uh, pick apart what is actually behind a change in a factor. So thank you for sharing that as well. So what were your other results then, I guess, since we are, we're already headed in that direction? Um, in, that, in that way, so this study basically established that we could use these kind of novel water-absorbing polymers for utilization uh, in agricultural applications. But uh, the second question that comes into play is that when you uh, use this kind of polymers, of course, we see an increase in the yield and the quality of these uh, vegetables. But there are also uh, questions that remain as to how does it uh, affects the long-term properties of soil. For instance, it can be how does the microbial uh, community uh, changes with ap application of these type of uh, uh, so-called amendments. We, uh, uh, the team at IIT Guwahati, uh, which is the previous university I was affiliated to, they have already published a paper this year on uh, what is the the effects of uh, the the uh, the microbial uh, community in these plants when you use this kind of uh, polymer? So please have a, a look into uh, the new work that we are currently doing. Sure. So when we're looking at, obviously, you're seeing a big increase in some of these uh, 
different elements that you were testing for. How does that compare with these more conventional types that are already existing? Is it similar results, better, worse? It, uh, it is uh, uh, better results in terms of the uh, so-called the yield of these uh, species. In terms of um, the so-called um, microbial community, there is not much of a difference, which is actually a good news that you do not want to see unwanted changes in the soil microbial biota or soil microbial community in the long in the long run. So, uh, I mean, it would be flaw. It would be it would be wrong of me to say that um, we are expect we are getting all good results. Uh, we, it needs a lot more study, um, and it is being done. So, I will be able to tell you long term effects of these uh, polymers uh, in the near future. Sure. So then, what? Uh, what other future research? You mentioned there's several avenues for more testing with these. So what does that look like? Well, uh, at, at Alto, uh, since I joined here, we are working on developing a similar kind of uh, water-absorbing polymers from other kinds of side streams or waste, such as we are uh, trying with tailings, mine tailings. So mine tailings is one of the biggest uh, unused waste uh, in Finland. Uh, and as you may not know, uh, the Nordic countries are one of the most uh, uh, one of the most developed uh, countries, which recycle almost eighty percent of their uh, waste. So now the challenge is that how do we change these kind of tailings uh, into these kind of water absorbing polymers so that number one, these kind of mine tailings are valorized, and number two. You can, in, in fact, create commodity that you can export to, say, southern uh, European countries, and uh, it, which are really struck by the droughts or uh, because of climate change, and how you can have a positive effect uh, in agricultural sector in southern Europe. Why I say so is that we currently, the Nordic countries, are extremely cold, so you do not get to grow a lot of vegetables per se. But the technology that we are trying to develop over here has implications in uh, in southern Europe or even other types of uh, developing economies. Oh, I like that a lot. I I really like the idea of kind of this teamwork of, you know, because presumably if you're not growing a lot of crops, you might be importing some um, or there might be a scenario where a country is like that. Um, so it's kind of this nice like helping them grow crops that will eventually help you in return. I like that. Um, I have an, a couple notes here that you also wanted to look at like different pH and salt salinity impacts from these. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So as I already mentioned uh, that we cannot, uh, or at least I, uh, being a scientific person, cannot say that the material behaves like a, uh, like a wonder. You need more uh, so-called tests to see how it's going to behave in different conditions. So by, by that, what I mean by soil pH or by so soil salinity is that when you are using these so-called um, artificial nutrients, you tend to change the pH and, this, uh, and the soil salinity over time. So in these so-called adverse conditions, how these kind of polymers will behave is still a question that is not answered, and it's something we are looking to uh, look for uh, to answer in in the near future. Sure, and then I I see there's another one for secondary effects. I know we've talked about the impact on kind of the the biome, uh, microbiome. Is there any other additional effects or different crops that you're looking at with with these? Uh, right now, uh, not so much, but we, uh, at, at least my background is in uh, not actually in agricultural science. My background is in geotechnical engineering. Uh, I'm a civil engineer uh, by profession. So we are now trying to see whether these kind of so-called uh, water-absorbing polymers uh, that we develop from ply ash, can we make something similar and make something hydrophobic so that it has applications in... Um, uh, in geotechnical ap in applications such as we want to make hydrophobic concrete, hydrophobic um, uh, basically infrastructure which will not be affected by the extreme cold that we face in Nordic regions. So here for specific applications, we now want to make polymers which are basically hydrophobic 
so that uh, the long-term durability of these concrete-like materials is uh, is maintained. Of course, I'm sorry that I went from all the way from agriculture to engineering, but you know, in today's world, everything is connected. Everything is connected. So, yeah, I mean, in, in the long-term research, this is what my team at least is doing at Alto. Oh, I love that. That's very fun. You don't need to apologize for that at all. You're right. Th you know, they all interconnect. Um, is that also made out of the fly ash or for the for that one right now we are working on utilizing uh, organic biomass uh, in say finland is one of the biggest forest uh, exporters in the world the forest pr products that come out of finland is, is one of the most sorted out uh, um, commodities uh, at least in europe and in china so through this processing we are uh, making a lot of these uh, bio-based waste materials so the idea is that if we can convert these kind of bio uh, mass into energy, and through this process we get these kind of so-called so hydrophobic polymers uh, during the whole process, and the idea is how we can utilize these kind of hydrophobic polymers from these bio waste materials into uh, different applications uh, for um, civil engineering. But yes, I have not left uh, the research topic on. Uh, uh, plants and agriculture, but yes, at, at this moment, uh, my focus has been mostly on uh, so-called construction materials. Sure. So I have three questions left for you. The first one is if listeners want to learn more about any of the things that we've talked about today, where can they go? Well, uh, you can always... Uh, uh, Google uh, myself and the, the co-authors uh, that are in these publications, which are based in uh, India and in China. So it was basically a multidisciplinary work. Uh, of course, uh, their contribution should always be acknowledged. And um, if you want to find me uh, related to these kind of works, uh, you can find me at uh, Aldo uh, University's website. Apart from that, we are also publishing a lot uh, uh, in this topic from my previous work. So anytime you um, have a quick Google uh, search, you can find uh, our current work on, on these topics uh, in the next one or two years. And uh, apart from that, um, you can also find me in LinkedIn. Uh, it's sanandam.bordoloi. Um, I'm happy to connect and collaborate and in the process learn from the, the, the community uh, of agriculturists and soil scientists. Uh, as I said today, uh, again, I'll reiterate again that I am a civil engineer, so, but uh, the joy of being a civil engineer is that the, the science that I'm, the research that I'm doing, it can have uh, so-called uh, positive effects in the field of uh, agricultural science. So everything is connected and you can learn from all of these fields. So I look forward for any uh, collaborations or any questions in that matter. Yeah, absolutely. We will include your contact information in our show notes. So if anybody wants to reach out, we would encourage that as well. So then my second question is if people then want to take that next step and kind of get involved with this, obviously they can reach out for collaboration with you, but what other ways can people get involved, whether that's researchers who are interested in this topic or farmers who are interested in using technologies like this on their farm? What can people do? Well, in, in, in academic uh, forefront, there is always uh, opportunities to collaborate um, there are a lot of European funding, a lot of uh, USDA funding um, on these kind of emerging bio-based interventions uh, for agricultural crops. I always welcome. Um, I always welcome collaboration. I always welcome multidisciplinary research. Uh, for agriculturists, um, it, it's uh, if to apply these kind of polymers, it still takes some time. So, it, it, as you know, any technology, particularly uh, when you're dealing with this. Uh, chemical or like polymer-based materials, you need to prove that this works first in a lab scale and then say in a field scale, and then can you produce these kind of materials in an industrial scale? So the step, uh, the next step for us is to produce these kind of materials in an industrial scale. And, and I hope we can do this in the next two or three years. 
and then um, people who want to um, uh, seek to utilize these kind of materials. I, I hope in the next two to three years they would be widely available uh, in, in stores near you and you can utilize these kind of so-called uh, eco-friendly and sustainable polymers from different types of waste materials uh, to kind of uh, satiate our soils. Sure. Awesome. That is great advice on multiple fronts for people who want to get involved. Final question for you is what is one fun fact that listeners wouldn't know about you if all they had was your research? Well, um, I think uh, research is there. It's just a part of me. But before research, I am a, uh, I am a son, I am a brother, um, and I am a person of faith. And after that, uh, I have other uh, things that I'm interested in, uh, such as sports. Uh, I practice jujitsu. I practice yoga. And and, uh, and lately, I've been uh, trying to be a better cook. So, yeah, I'm just a person who likes to do science. Uh, and and I, I guess th that is something that people uh, find it hard to uh, sometimes figure out about professors or uh, people who are scientists that we are just people uh, and this is our basically bread and butter this is how we get food on the table yeah yeah that's part of why we asked the question to kind of let people get to know you as a person also that's that's very cool about the cooking are you is there a specific dish that you enjoy making or is like one you want to tackle next well, uh, I mostly practice Indian foods. I love Mexican. During my time in U.S., I really, really enjoyed Mexican food. Uh, and uh, if that's a question, I also have an Instagram channel uh, where I uh, post uh, my dishes. Uh, it's a quirky name. It's called Plates with Benefits, basically Indian recipes which have health benefits. So uh, give me a follow there if you're interested in uh, so-called cooking and other avenues. Oh, fun. I like that a lot. <laughs> nice. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the research that you are doing. It's obviously really helpful with a lot of emerging things that are happening on our planet. So thank you for the work you're doing and kind of bridging the gap between engineering and agriculture. Thank you so much, Abby, and everyone involved for giving this uh, platform to uh, echo my thoughts. A special thanks to the podcast, Field Lab and Earth, and the Soil Science Society of America, and everyone involved uh, for giving uh, young researchers like me uh, a so-called platform to voice our research as also voice a part of our research philosophy. Uh, thank you so much. Of course. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Michael. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Yeah. Hello, Abby. Thanks for having me on the show. My name is Michael Raby. I was born and raised in Michigan. I did my undergraduate studies at Michigan State University. And prior to graduate school, I worked on a golf course as a golf course superintendent. I have over 10 years experience in the golf industry, and now I'm almost done with my master's degree at Michigan State University in the plant, soil, and microbial sciences department under the direction of Dr. Tom Nikolai. Awesome. And what are you currently researching? Uh, currently, I research a new irrigation method for golf course putting greens. So the typical golf course putting green is irrigated with overhead sprinklers, as are many crops. Well, here at Michigan State University, we have constructed a site to compare this widely adopted method of overhead irrigation with a new method of sub-irrigation called capillary hydroponics that supplies irrigation directly to the roots of the turf grass plant. The goal being to evaluate the two systems for their ability to provide a high performance playing surface for the game of golf and to quantify differences in the amount of irrigation required. Awesome. If you could have your dream project, what would that be? I honestly think that I'm already working on my dream project. Uh, when I worked in the industry, I idolized turf managers who were on the cutting edge of technology. And the industry is filled with men and women who value efficiency and who are proud to be stewards of land and natural resources. 
So to be involved in a project that can bring them the technology to do their jobs better while preserving our natural resources is a dream come true. Very cool. Well, if you'd like to get in touch with Michael about his work, we'll have his contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you. Thank you.